Thank you, Toby. That was worshipful, biblical, Christ-glorifying. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Scott alluded to this already in his prayer this morning. We're going to be thinking about prophecy, more specifically prophecies. And that makes me think about this statement, you know, pre predicting the future is challenging to say the least, right? Have you ever tried to predict the exact score of a football game? I mean, it's hard enough to even know who's going to win, of course, but the exact score is near impossible. It's a lot like predicting the weather in Texas. <laughs> we're, we're told storms are going to come, and then no storms come. And then when a whole week of storms come, there was like hardly any warning at all. Try predicting the stock market. Uh, no one predicted COVID, of course. Here's a challenge for you young couples out there. Go ahead and conceive another child or your first and, and go ahead and try to predict when that child will be born to the day, his personality or her personality, character, what work they will do in their life and who and when they will marry. Yeah, challenging to say the least. Not even the devil can predict the future, but God can. God can because God ordained it. God knows it perfectly. He knows the future as well as he knows the present and the past. He knows the future of crystal clarity. And in his grace to us, in his goodness toward us, he predicted the future through prophets. And one of the greatest of these prophets was a man by the name of Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters of God's word through him as a spokesman, as a prophet. And among these 66 chapters, there are extensive predictions about both the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Sometimes those predictions might be found in the same short passage or even the same verse. Isaiah writing 700 years before Mary would deliver that boy making precise, numerous predictions about the first coming and the second coming of the Messiah. It's been said that 25% of the Bible, when it was spoken or written, was prophecy, which begs the question, why? Why would God give us so much prophecy? And I think the simplest and most clear answer is this. God gave prophecy to birth and grow faith. God told us what was going to happen in the future over and over and over again so that we would believe he's God, so that we would put our faith in him. It is through the word of God that faith is actually engendered. Faith is created. And so this is the primary reason why we have so much prophecy. There are extensive, then, messianic prophecies throughout the scriptures, beyond Isaiah, of course. And when you put all of them together, they leave no doubt. They leave no doubt that only one person could fulfill all of these prophecies. And that one person was the man we call Jesus of Nazareth. Today, we're going to see a small slice, a small sample size of some of these glorious Christ-focused prophecies. So follow along as I read Matthew 12, 15 to 21. <clears throat> but Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Bow with me in a short prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this amazing prophecy of Isaiah. 
Help us, Lord, to understand it. Come by your spirit, this same spirit, and illuminate and convert and convict and comfort and teach and strengthen. And even, Lord, we pray, create faith this morning in this place. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, some key observations about this prophecy here in Matthew 12 as we begin. God the Father is referenced here or referred to six times. The Holy Spirit is referred to one time. And Jesus the Messiah, you ready for this? 17 times. 17 times in this short prophecy. I say short prophecy, but that's really not correct because this is the longest Old Testament citation in the book of Matthew. This is it. And it comes from Isaiah, particularly Isaiah chapter 42, 1 to 4. You may want to find that. We're not going to go read it in its entirety, but you may want to have that handy. Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. The final observation I'll make about this prophecy is its tone. It has a warm tone, a gentle tone. It actually is, is a, it's quiet. It's uh, hopeful. Uh, this is not fire and brimstone. Uh, this is not lightning bolts from the throne of God striking down wayward sinners. This is the tone that would describe the one who has already said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. This is the tone that will describe the one who will say of himself, I am humble and lowly. I am gentle at heart, and you can find rest for your souls. And so Isaiah uh, here has spoken. Matthew has chosen this passage to continue his theme that he really began in verse 28 of chapter 11. Our text idea then is this in one sentence. By quietly withdrawing from those plotting to kill him and warning his followers not to make him known, Jesus was intentionally fulfilling ancient prophecies from Isaiah. Jesus was deliberately, knowingly, consciously fulfilling prophecies from Isaiah. I just have to laugh at the people, liberal scholars, they, they, they just come up with stuff out of thin air. They would say that Jesus didn't know he was the Messiah. They would say that, that he wasn't aware of, of God's uh, anointing of him and, that, and in his role for life. And these are the same people that will move away from the atonement and say Jesus was a martyr. Well, he absolutely was aware of who he was. And this is one instance where he goes into the book of Isaiah himself and intentionally fulfills what Isaiah said had to be true about the coming Messiah. My prayer this morning is for you to be drawn to Jesus Christ as you learn lessons from these prophecies that have already been fulfilled. My prayer is that God would birth faith in this place. My prayer is that God would grow the faith of every believer here today as we ponder and consider and learn about these fulfilled prophecies. But before we get to them, we must start with the setting of this uh, prophecy. What teed it up was verses 15 to 17. Let's go back and look at that. So if you were here last week, you remember that Jesus got into this conflict with the Pharisees, these sticklers for the law, these sticklers for man's tradition. He got into conflict with them, butted heads, and it was on the Sabbath. And then to show them that he was Lord of the Sabbath, he, he healed this man's withered hand. And it says in verse 14, the Pharisees then went out and they plotted against Jesus. They, they had this secret meeting that they decided that they're going to kill Jesus. Then look at verse 15, but Jesus knowing, Jesus aware of this. So their secret meeting was not so secret <laughs> to the Messiah. He knows this is going to happen. And now he begins to defy all expectations, all Jewish expectations of what the Messiah would be and what the Messiah would do. Instead of charging in guns blazing with these men who are plotting to kill him, he does something entirely different. He withdraws. So he doesn't charge in guns blazing, nor does he hang around to let them do it here in the moment. He pulls away. He pulls back. He withdraws. Jesus is not going to crush them, and he's not going to seek martyrdom. 
he's going to strike a balance somewhere in between. So instead of doing either of those things, he quietly slips away. This is actually a theme throughout the Gospel of Matthew. It starts all the way back when he was a baby and he withdrew into Egypt. And then he withdrew into Galilee, and then he withdrew into Nazareth. And so there's this pattern. When John the Baptist is arrested, Jesus withdraws. And when John the Baptist is executed, Jesus gets in a boat and goes to a secluded place by himself. There's a pattern of Jesus withdrawing when there is opposition or when there is pain. And that's what's happening here. It's a very quiet thing. It's a very gentle thing. But we go on in the text. He withdrew from there. But look at verse 15. Many followed him. And he healed them all. Meaning he healed all of them who were sick. All of them who were diseased. All of them who had problems of their physical, of a physical nature. And this is counterintuitive because he knows that the more he heals, the more popular he will be. And the more popular he is, the more opposition there will be. And so he's withdrawing from opposition, but he still heals them all. It's as if he can't help himself. This goes against the plan of withdrawing, and yet he is compassion personified. He sees a need, meets the need. He, he cannot hold back in showing the mercies of God to these broken, hurting people. But if we ask ultimately, why does he withdraw and why does he warn in verse 16? He warns them not to tell who he was. In other words, don't make it public that I'm the Messiah. Keep it under your hat. It's not time for that to become well known because the more well known that is, the more rejection and opposition there will be. And there's a timetable here, right? There is a place and a time for his death. And so he's managing that place and time. And so he has to manage the opposition that will build to that place and time. And so he's along the way, he will warn people that he heals not to go around announcing it, to keep it under wraps. So we ask the question, ultimately, why did he withdraw and why did he warn? And we don't have to speculate. And we don't have to guess because Matthew tells us in verse 17, he withdrew and he warned to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah, the prophet. And it's Isaiah chapter 42, which if you know anything about the book of Isaiah, you would know that this is the first of four servant of Yahweh songs they're called in Isaiah. The first of four of these songs. And, it, and the fourth one ends with the well-known Isaiah 53. The first one is in Isaiah chapter 42. The last one is Isaiah 53 with the cross and the suffering of the Messiah. And so this is the place where Jesus, through Matthew, dives in to show that he fulfills these prophecies. Now, you could have an hour-long study of the differences between Isaiah 42, 1 to 4, and Matthew 18 to 21. And we're not going to do that. I'm just going to give you a couple of the highlights. This is Matthew's own translation. It has components of the Septuagint. It has components of the Masoretic text. But this is Matthew's translation of the Hebrew. And it has two big changes from Isaiah in his passage. The first one is Matthew skips part of verse 4. He skips part of verse 4 of Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. And he does so so that he can get to the last part of that verse, verse 4, where he will make a change. So for the most part, it follows the text of Isaiah, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. Then he gets to verse 4. He leaves out part of verse 4, and then he changes the last line. And I'm going to give you both sides, all right? And Isaiah, verse 4, reads like this. Then the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Then the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Matthew changes that to verse 21, and in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Wait expectantly becomes hope, coastlands becomes Gentiles, but the big, big change is law becomes in his name. This will mean volumes as we go along. Tuck that away. So today I want to show you four prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus at the first coming. 
That's your outline. And these prophecies are to create or grow faith. And I want to grow your love for Jesus this morning, your affection for Jesus this morning because of these prophecies. So, number one, he must be the object of God's boasting. Look at verse 18, the first two lines. They're parallel. And they are God's boasting of the Messiah. Behold, look, check this out. My servant, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. This is God the Father speaking of God the Son. This is God the Father boasting. He, he gives two identities then to the Messiah, two critical characteristics or identities. The first, my chosen servant there in verse 18. And the word for servant here is not doulos. It's not the word for slave. It's paidos. It's the word that can be translated child or boy. My chosen boy. My chosen child, God is saying. At the Mount of Transfiguration, according to Luke 9.35, this is what God the Father said of Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. Quote, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. You see, Jesus Christ is the prototype chosen one. He himself was elect before the foundation of the world. First Peter says that he was foreknown or loved in advance before the creation of the universe. And so underline this, tuck this away. At the Mount of Transfiguration, God says of Jesus, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Matthew goes on, the next phrase is my beloved and I think this is shorthand for my beloved son because of these other passages. My beloved in whom my soul, God has a soul. God has a, a being here, his life. My beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. God looking at Jesus saying, I'm, I approve of him. I'm satisfied in him. I'm well pleased with him. I delight in him. I'm bragging on him. I'm boasting in him. Jesus, the Messiah, had to be the object of God's own boasting. Now, I say here, my beloved son, because of what God said at his baptism, which we've already seen in Matthew 3, verse 17. God said out loud at the baptism of Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. All right. So what do we have here in these first two lines of this prophecy? We have a father boasting in his son. And we have a father who delights in his son. And here's something that strikes me about this. The Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus didn't really do anything. He just transfigured himself. It was just like, here's, here's my nature on display. At his baptism, he didn't really do anything. He just got baptized. This is the father saying, I delight in his being before his doing. It really strikes me that Jesus, who performed 39 miracles that are recorded for us in the New Testament, at no point while he or right after he had done a miracle did God say, this is my beloved son, listen to him. God says it two times at his baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration. This is a father delighting in the very being of his son, whether he did anything or not. It's not based on performance. It's based on your essence, your, your nature, who you are. This is God saying, look at my boy. Look at my boy. He's putting me on display. Pure delight. Total 100% approval. Now, I ask you, how awesome must he be for God to brag on him? This is God. This is the flawless, majestic, holy, awesome God who is doing this bragging. If the infinitely great God is boasting in Jesus, where does that leave us? You see, boasting like this happens when your soul is satisfied in him. When you delight in him more than anything or anyone else, you can't help yourself. But it all goes back to what does your soul delight in? What, what do you find 
the most pleasure in, what satisfies you at the deepest level. And if it's Jesus Christ, you will join the Father in boasting in him. The application is simple. We need to verbalize our praise for this Messiah. And it needs to go beyond, praise the Lord for it. I mean, this is the highlight. It needs to go beyond these songs that we sing on Sunday mornings. It needs to be part of every day of our life. Every day we should be verbalizing and bragging and boasting in Christ. And I I submit to you that you will and I will to the degree that we are satisfied in his person. When we delight in the beauty of who he is as very God of very God and man of man. So first of all, he had to be the object of God's own boasting. Second, he must be empowered by God's spirit for ministry. So look at the last part, uh, the next part of verse 18 and verse 19. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim or preach or announce justice or righteousness to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, will, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He, he must be empowered by God's Spirit. Well, of course, this is really the essence of what it means to be the Messiah. Remember that sermon we talked about Messiah at length? It means anointed one. That's, the, that's what the name, the title means. And so, of course, he must live in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is so confused by most Christians. Most Christians leaning strong and and holding fast to the deity of Christ, that he is fully God in human form, believe that he then lived his life depending on his deity, which is not the case. He lived his life as a man depending on God the Holy Spirit. He set aside the privileges of being fully God, Philippians 2, and he lived as you and I have to live, as our example So he prayed in the power of the Spirit, and he preached in the power of the Spirit, and every miracle was in the power of the Spirit. And he lived in the power of the Spirit, and he responded to opposition in the power of the Spirit. God put his Spirit upon him, as the Bible says, without measure. God placed upon him and filled him and sealed him, and and he was consumed by and controlled by God, the Holy Spirit, as the second Adam as the last Adam living in our place, living in our stead, living as the way you and I have to live as little Christians, little anointed ones. And so he is the prototype. And so it empowered all of his ministry from start to finish. He never said a thing or or did a thing or thought a thing that wasn't empowered by God the Holy Spirit. It was like the wind in his sails carrying him along in his ministry. And specifically here, we see in verse 18, he was empowered to proclaim God's righteousness to the Gentiles. I'm not sure what Isaiah meant by this phrase, but I'm pretty sure that Matthew means the gospel. I think Matthew here means when he says justice to the Gentiles in verse 18, I think he means the offer of of a righteous kingdom. I think he means the proclamation of God's own righteousness to the Gentiles. I think Matthew is alluding here to the good news of the gospel. Now, what was the symbol? What was the symbol for the Holy Spirit at the baptism of Jesus? A dove. This proclamation of justice to the Gentiles would be done with dove-like gentleness. He would proclaim a righteous kingdom offer then to those who were beyond Judaism. We've already seen this in Matthew. He would settle in Galilee of the Gentiles in fulfillment of prophecy. Galilee was an area north there in 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 the nation, an area that had more Gentiles than down in Judah Uh, near Jerusalem and that's where Jesus would settle the Jews are expecting something other than these four by the way these we might look at these and say well of course no big deal all the way down the list today but the Jews were not expecting any of these four when the Messiah would come especially uh, as we move along more so what the Jews expected 
was the Messiah to exercise military might and political force to, to bring in his kingdom by force of power. And what they got instead was a lowly servant. They expected a king to ride in on a white horse and kill all of his enemies, and instead they got a carpenter's son who washed feet. What they were expecting was a hawk to swoop in and terrorize the Gentiles, and what they got was a dove who came and gently landed upon a lamb. A dove's not going to land on a lion, but he lands on a lamb. And he will have a lamb-like, dove-like ministry. See, what we're seeing here is the demeanor of Jesus. What we're seeing is how Jesus carried about in his earthly life. This is first coming Jesus. He has a demeanor that is marked mostly by what he would not do, verse 19. He would not wrangle. He would not argue. He would not quarrel. He would not scream at people. He would not yell at people, submit to me. Do it now. He would not march down Main Street with a megaphone so that everyone in the streets and everyone at the town square could hear, oh, here comes that Jesus again. <laughs> That's not how he operated. That's not how he was. He would not quarrel. He would not yell out. He would not be heard in the streets. He was quiet, but he was not quietistic. He was humble, but he was not passive. He was a bold preacher, but he was not combative. And so we're, we're seeing here how the Holy Spirit empowered him distinctly, what that looked like in his first coming ministry. And this is a model for us because, listen, we are in between the first and the second coming. If we're going to adopt a model for ministry, it's going to be the model of the first coming Jesus, not the second coming Jesus. <laughs> you see, we can't argue someone into the kingdom. We can't force someone to believe in Christ. We can't guilt someone into faith. We must not wrangle, nor cry out, nor let our voice be heard in the streets. This speaks to our demeanor. This speaks to our attitude. Browbeating, Bible thumping, and finger pointing do not work. They do not work. But Holy Spirit empowered words work. When we, we don't, don't, don't open your mouth unless you're walking in the Spirit. Make sure that you're filled with the Spirit, representing the true and living God through Christ. This is why we too must live empowered by the Spirit. Well, you know, actually we are God's chosen servants and His children as well. And He's put His Spirit within us as well. Jesus is our model. Jesus is our prototype. But what I want you to see is that we are in between the first and second coming. And too many Christians are acting like second coming kind of attitudes and demeanors. And that is not what God's called us to in this age. That brings us to number three. We'll say more about this in number three. Not only must he be the object of God's boasting, and not only must he be empowered by God's Spirit, but he must be gentle toward the weak. Look at verse 20. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. Now here in verse 20, I think he is speaking now at the end of this, of the second coming. I think the justice there is judgment justice. Victory is the victory of the second coming. And until he comes in the second coming, until he leads God's judgment to victory through the tribulation and the return of Christ, until that happens, a battered reed he will not break off. He will be gentle toward the weak. This is so wonderful. This is so precious. Jesus will not snap off the bent twig. <laughs> Jesus will not crush out the dying ember. You see, when the second coming happens, the lion will roar. And his demeanor, listen now, this is so critical. This was like my aha moment this week. <laughs> his demeanor at the second coming will match the task of the second coming. 
He will roar like a lion. But his demeanor at the first coming had to match the task of the first coming, which was to die on a cross. And here it is. And so what he fulfills then is he is gentle toward the weak. I want to spend some time applying this third point because I think it is such a wonderful thing to see for us this morning. I want to begin with those of you who are right now the bruised reed or the smoldering candle. Do you feel that way this morning? Do you feel battered and beaten down? Do you feel like a a bent twig hanging by a thread? Do you feel like you're a candle in the wind and your flame for Christ is barely alive? It's barely flickering. Are you oppressed and afflicted this morning? Have you been the victim of misunderstanding or loneliness? Have you been the victim of prejudice or racism or or a crime? Abuse or neglect, Satan or sin, disease or death? taking someone you love. You know, sometimes we suffer for self-inflicted wounds. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy, and we are the one to blame for our suffering. But sometimes the battered reed is innocent. Sometimes the battered reed is broken by someone else's sin, or maybe just broken by life. Here is the good news for us this morning. If you are the battered reed, and if you are the smoldering wick, Jesus is especially drawn to you. Jesus is especially mindful of you. The broken one himself invites you to come to himself and find healing for your batteredness and your brokenness and your bruises. You see, he too was broken. He is the ultimate battered reed. And he offers to you today himself. He says to you today, come to me, come to me. You who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I did not come to crush you, I came to save you. I did not come to condemn you, I came to heal you. Jesus is especially drawn to the sinful, to the broken, to the dirty, to the convicted, to the contrite of heart. That's what Isaiah meant by let the valleys be lifted up. See, he he stays away from the mountains. He stays away from those who are lifted up in pride and self-sufficiency and and self-righteousness. And that's why Isaiah said, let the mountains be brought low, but let the valleys be lifted up. He doesn't walk by you today and take his foot and grind you into the ground to put you out of your misery, to snuff you out, to break you off. He won't do that until he leads justice to victory. This is the age of grace. This is the day of salvation. And that day is going to end, and we don't know when. And when it ends, he won't have the demeanor of a dove. And so take advantage today of gentle, lowly Jesus before it is too late. Next, I want to speak to you who are believers this morning. And show you that this is our model for ministry in his name. To remind you that we are still under the first coming demeanor of General Jesus. We are still under the, the administration of this. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. We're still under Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. We're still under the administration of gentleness to the weak. I want to remind you today that you are an ambassador of the crucified Christ. You are a spokesman for the crucified Christ. You live in the age of the cross, bearing a cross in the face of rejection, in the face of opposition, in the face of hatred, but letting that hatred cause us to love the hater even more. 
When the kingdom comes, we will rule with him and we will reign with him and we will judge with him. And who knows, we may even execute with him. But we are not in the kingdom. The kingdom hasn't come yet. We are in the age of the cross. We're not in the age of the crown. We are battered reeds and and flickering candle wicks. We are the broken. And we represent gentle Jesus to other battered reeds and other flickering candles. One beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. And so I say this, let every Christian be done with inflammatory rhetoric on Facebook. Let every Christian be done with trolling on Instagram. Let us all be done with combative texts and emails that don't represent gentle Jesus. Let us learn to be patient like Christ, to be tender-hearted like Christ, to be quiet like Christ, to be kind like Christ. Until Jesus comes and until he leads victory to justice. Peter understood. He had these words in his epistle. He said, for you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Who committed no sin. Nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he uttered no threats. But he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23. He would be the object of God's boasting. He would be empowered by God's spirit. He would be gentle toward the weak. And number four. He would be the hope of all nations. Verse 21, and in his name, in his character, in his attributes, in his being, in his person, in his trustworthy nature, the Gentiles will hope. This is a first coming prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. And how ironic is it, right? We go from Jews who are rejecting him Pharisees who are plotting to kill him to Gentiles who are hoping in him. So unexpected, and yet there in the prophecy of Isaiah. This rejection, this withdrawal, this Gentile hope, all prophesied, all foretold 700 years before the church age. Here we see an anticipation of the Great Commission at the end of this book. Here we see an anticipation of going to all the world with the gospel message. Go out into all the nations. It was prophesied in Isaiah. Matthew here says it's fulfilled in Christ. Which begs the question, was it fulfilled in Christ at his first coming? Did Gentiles hope in him at his first coming? And I answer, oh yeah. Yeah, they did. This started before the resurrection. Chapter 2, Magi, Gentiles, show up and worship this newborn king. Chapter 8, there is a Roman centurion with a paralyzed servant, and Jesus heals him with a word. And there will be the demon possessed Gadarenes on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, and there will be a Syro-Phoenician woman who will take crumbs from his table. And there will be a centurion, another centurion, who will witness his death, and he will say, Behold, the Son of God. Jesus becoming the hope of the Gentiles before he's even resurrected, before he gives the Great Commission. In fact, the hopeful John the Baptist said this, Knowing that the Jews would reject him and Jesus, he said, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. You know that you were once a stone. (laughs) If you're a Gentile here this morning hoping in Christ, you were a stone that God raised up and made you a child of Abraham. So yeah, it was fulfilled in his first coming, but of course, it's continuously being fulfilled even to this very moment in time, even to this very place on the planet. We hope in his reliable character, do we not? 
We Gentiles are hoping in Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our Messiah. We place our faith in his nature, not our nature. We believe in his name, not our name. It is his name that has merit with God, not our name. Has this prophecy been fulfilled? Well, let me tell you something. Billions of people have cashed the check of salvation. A check signed by Jesus with his own blood, drawing on the infinite grace of God's account. Billions. And the bank is still open. The account is not diminished in the least. Gentiles are still hoping in him. Would he be the object of God's boasting? Check. Would he be empowered by the Holy Spirit? Check. Would he be gentle toward the weak? Check. And right now, right now, this moment in every state of the United States of America, right now on every continent on this planet, and perhaps in every single country, there are Gentiles hoping in the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, the estimate is right now there are one billion evangelical Protestant Christians who are looking only to Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins and only to Jesus for the gift of eternal life, only to Jesus as the only legitimate hope of the world. A billion. Isn't it time that you join them? Isn't it time that you join the nations and the Gentiles who are placing all of their hope in Christ Jesus the Lord? Let's pray. Indeed, Father, it is time because it is the day of salvation. It is the age of grace when we hope in his name. And here we are on the other side of the world from Israel. Here we are 21 centuries removed. Here we are taking our stand on Jesus. Here we are standing firm on him as our foundation, hoping cherishing, loving this gentle Savior. And Lord, our hope is Jesus. Our hope is that he will come back from heaven, even today, blow the last trumpet, rescue the bride of Christ, snatch us up from this world, and then bring justice to victory. But in the meantime, Lord, help us to have the first coming demeanor of Christ. Help us to be dove-like in our delivery, in our tone, in our attitude, in our love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.